Thank you to thank you to those of you who have joined us. We'll be starting momentarily. We are uh, expecting the council member to join us momentarily. Uh, for those of you who have just joined us, uh, thank you for joining us at the top of the hour. We are expected to be joined by the council member momentarily.
welcome. We see the count on the Zoom. Uh, do you have an update for us? Actually, uh, he's trying to get in. This is Wanda, his chief of staff. I'm trying to change my name. It wasn't working for him, so I wanted to try the link. So give us a couple of seconds. He's just having a couple of challenges, but he will be in momentarily. Thank you so much. You're welcome. He is still having some challenges, but he is trying to join. Give me a second. He's just texting me. Give me a second. Okay, I think he's finally have it. So we look like he's good and he's coming on momentarily. Thank you for your patience. No problem. Thank you. Welcome. How you been? I've been great. How are you? How's the family? Everybody's good. Everybody's That's doing great. well. Okay. Staying That's busy. Great. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay. And yeah, we're doing well over here. That's great. Her granddaughter, she's 13, doing. Really oh, my proud goodness. Of her, yeah. mm -hmm. They grow up too, too fast. <laughs> sure do.
<laughs> yeah, he told me he was in, so let's see what he. Did we hear you, Councilman? We can't hear you. Special Hello. Hey, Councilman, how are you? I'm well. I was making sure you can hear me. Okay, so we're ready to get started. I'm going to start off and then I'll introduce you and here I go. So hey, everybody, we've been uh, standing by and are happy to hear from Councilman Trayon White. This is Tony Williams, CEO of the Federal City Council for District Strong, where we're still coming together, working together and succeeding together to make the district a better place. Part of this is uh, really uh, engaging with uh, key leaders of the district uh, to uh, address the uh, challenges facing us uh, resolve to action, get us to a better place. And today is no different. We're very pleased, a little technical glitch, but very pleased to have with us today, Councilman Trayon White hailing from Ward 8. He brings to his uh, councilmanship, if you will, to his uh, leadership, uh, broad community engagement in Ward 8, deep uh, community involvement with the families and the organizations there. And now uh, after uh, terms on the district council, a citywide perspective uh, on the key objectives that we ought to be uh, looking at here in the District of Columbia. So, Councilman, thank you for being with us today. Good morning, and thank you, Mayor Williams, and and everyone on your team for having me. Uh, thanks. I look forward to the, to the dialogue and meaningful conversation. Yeah. So, I'm going to be talking to the Councilman. I understand you've got to leave at. Uh, 1130, 1140, yeah. or what's your, what's your, uh, schedule? It's 1215, man. <laughs> I'm, excuse me, at 12, I got my time wrong. 1240, yeah, yeah, I have a, uh, I'm on a panel with a DC jail today at one o'clock. So we got to be set up on set on TV by, by 1245. And so we're going to work through it and, and we can come back and we can do it again. Um, whatever we need to do to make it happen. Okay, so uh, we'll look to 1240. So, hey, so uh, just talk to us about uh, how, how you see the major uh, challenges facing you as Councilman of Ward 8 get us rolling here. And thank you again for being with us. I'll talk to you for about 10, 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll have broad questions and answers for about 15 minutes. But go ahead, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, uh, for me, it, it's, it has historically been an economic challenge. Um, it relates to trying to help residents um, earn higher incomes to uh, to create a better quality of life. Um, we have a, a wealth gap in D.C. And the wealth gap is widening every year, especially between uh, um, uh, people of color, blacks, Hispanics, and whites. Um, and the reality is in Ward 8, people who can't afford to live anywhere else in Washington, D.C., 
chance to navigate each of the Anacostia River. So you got some of the same social issues, some of the same problems uh, piling on top of each other. Uh, and I, I think that we as a city have to do a better job um, figuring out ways to get people to a higher earning potential. That means better education, more trades, more skills, more of our young people going to college, uh, um, more internships, more summer jobs, just a, a lot of other different things that have, has not been happening historically in D.C. that used to happen in the city. Um, we, as you know, uh, we historically had one grocery store serving 85,000 people. Um, um, that has changed a little bit because we brought in part of Ward 6 into Ward 8, and we have grocery stores there, but on the east of the river, we've been struggling to keep grocery stores open. That Even the two we did open in the last two years are now closed in two years. Um, and so we haven't found an uh, equitable solution to that. Um, and Ward 8 is a, is a beautiful place to live with, but faced with many challenges to help disparities uh, some of the highest per capita in the country. Um, you talk about, you know, access to quality health care. I and mean, I know Vincent Gray has been keen on this as far as helping to create a health care system. And so we've begun building a state of the health care ho um, hospital. We have two urgent facilities already up and running east of Anacostia River. So we've been zeroing in on that um, and trying to support uh, homeowners and, and business owners. You know, we're in a, in a community where 75% of the people rent and mm -hmm. that causes, you know, the wealth gap to be even wider because we're taking your money, dumping it into a black hole every month and not really seeing the benefits of home ownership or, or, or the equity that can happen in Washington, D.C. So how does um, that, Poverty, how, crime. Yeah, I go yeah, how does, <laughs> yeah, how does that translate then into your legislative agenda as a councilman? What are your top, let's say, three legislative agenda items right now as a councilman um, from Ward 8? Yeah. And on so your one, committees, you know. Yep. So one of the things we well, well one one of the things we did early on was we uh, created legislation to get money into the budget to fund a new grocery store, which was Good Food Market on South Capitol Atlantic, um, through the Michaels Project. We did that. We also put I also uh, cre created legislation to create one of the biggest community food gardens in Washington D.C. called the Well at Oxen Run. It's phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, someone should pull it up and pull a picture up of it. It, it. It's second to none. We drafted that concept through um, some some things we did in Africa, also in partnership with DC Greens, and so we made that come to fruition. That's up and running. It's very beautiful, right there, Auction Run. Um, I, I've been integral in creating uh, new money for small businesses. East Anacostia River called the Dream Grant that comes out since I for at least five years through DSLBD. We just did something new last year, which is called the uh, DC Community Investment Fund, where we uh, gave seed money and we paired them with a bank to help not only make money, but also build their credit through uh, some funding came from the DC Community Investment Fund uh, for minority businesses. That was last year was our first year. We got it in the budget again this year and it's gonna be coming out um, this year again. Um, there are a number of things. Uh, we. It, it's been historically known that in the past 15 years, we closed down over 12 recreation centers in Ward 8. And the Ward has the highest amount of youth out of anywhere in Washington, D.C. And so right now in the plan, we, we worked on getting in the budget and funding five new recreation centers in, in Ward 8. Uh, one is already up and running, which is in partnership with KIPP at Furby Hope. That's up and built. We got Douglas on, on in the pipeline. We got Anacostia Rec in the start, start of construction uh, a few weeks ago. We got uh, Congress Heights, um, Congress Park, and I think that's it. Oh, oh Anacost that's the Anacostia. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's five right now in the pipeline. Well, so one it already sounds like a lot of, Yeah, it sounds like a lot of uh, uh, agendas, uh, um, you know, refurbishing, uh, expanding, supporting services, whether they're recreation or human services. And also, uh, you were talking about shopping, retail, economic development. What do you think are some of the strengths there that you want to uh, exploit and capitalize on out there uh, to bring more economic development to Ward 8? What are some of the strengths that people should be looking to? Well, I mean, you you know, as a former mayor, Ward 8 is the last, Ward 7 and Ward 8 and other pockets, small pockets throughout the city, is one of the last parcels that's been not as developed as much. You know, you look up 14th Street, 
uh, H Street, U Street, a lot of these corridors have already been developed to a place where, you know, it's pretty much where it is going to be. And so we have a lot of potential. We have a lot of land. We have a lot of uh, what we're building. The new building for the Department of Health is probably going to be roughly $4 billion spent in Ward 8 in the next five years in development. We have a number of things happening at St. Elizabeth East Campus, uh, Willow Road, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue with the Union Square, Howard Road with red brick. Uh, it, 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 it's a lot of potential for to do some great work in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a space in a vein that's community friendly, that's comprehensive and inclusive of the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you uh, talk about uh, uh, attracting, uh, you know, more citizens, more investment, economic development in Ward 8, Talk about the role that you think public safety plays and all that. Well, for example, um, I was integral in working with uh, Mayor Bowser and Demped into doing the first TIF in Ward 8 tax increment financing for a deal at Reunion Square that encompasses uh, a government building, a hotel, and a new state-of-the-art senior living facility. Um, but the challenge is that uh, as the crime rises, some of our local businesses, like for instance, Giant. I don't know if you saw uh, a month ago, we had to do a press release because of the crime in Giant. Giant was contemplating closing its doors. We had to meet with them and reassure them that we support you from the community, from the DC government, we do whatever it takes. So we won't have our largest grocery option closed down. Um, and then, you know, robberies. You're talking about people that are afraid to go in and out of their businesses. We had some of the, we were doing a walk with the mayor probably about four months ago. And some of the people along Goho Road was coming outside in the businesses saying, we glad you all are here because it's hard for us to get in our doors for the number of people that's hanging outside. Some of our cars have been carjacked. Some of our, uh, it's been some robberies. And so some of those things are, are real issues that, is, that we need to address uh, in a public health uh, approach to addressing crime in our city that I think we haven't done enough investments in time and a real strategy for dealing with crime in our city. I just don't think we have. Well, I know you've made, uh, you've taken some stands uh, that are out there uh, beyond your uh, council colleagues in terms of, uh, you know, addressing in an intense, urgent way the public safety crime issue in D.C. Uh, would yeah. you, do you think we ought to be shifting additional resources to the crime fight? Uh, the, we, we have the upcoming budget coming up. Your view? Uh, absolutely. I, I believe that that the, the, the budget is, is a moral document for what you care about, you know? Mm -hmm. And I say it all the time that, I, that the crime in D.C. has been like cancer. It's been historically uh, east of Anacostia River and all in small pockets throughout the city. Bananas spread everywhere. You can go anywhere and there'd be a shooting, a carjacking, mm -hmm. a robbery, a fight. And there's been mm -hmm. a couple of mass shootings where several people mm -hmm. in crowds got mm -hmm. shot on mm -hmm. U Street. I mean, several events. Uh, funerals. There have been several mm -hmm. shootings at funerals, which is unprecedented in the city. And I think that just like the pandemic, we have so many calls, we have so many federal partners, our local partners, our community, everybody's involved in these calls every day, trying to figure out what we can do to stabilize the community, to address the issue, to keep it down. We're not doing that as related to crime. It's yeah. just, it's, it's becoming the status quo in the district. And we've seen the highest crime we've seen in three years in the last 22 years. Yep, 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 yep. Hey, so everybody, we've got uh, Councilman Trayon White here uh, we're talking about uh, the strengths as well as uh, some of the challenges facing uh, Ward 8 and East of the River. Great conversation. You're going to be joining in. So, Kevin, a uh, conversation from uh, our uh, guests with Councilman Trayon White. Please do join the conversation. Click raise your hand. We'll welcome you directly or type a question in the Q&A. Uh, council member, I'd like to start with a question from Charlene Drew Jarvis. Formal council member couldn't be here today, but wish, wish she could have been to be with you. Um, she asks that we all know that since the pandemic, there are fewer students that are going are going to school. There's a big challenge with absenteeism. What do you think the DC government can do to help identify young people who should be in school and have them tested to uh, get to the right place within the public education system? Thank you, uh, Ms. Jobs, and thank you for your service to the district. Um, I met a Mr. Jobs a few days ago, first time, so. Um, it's an honor. Um, thank you for your service. So one of the things we have to do is got to make school attractive. We got to make school a place where people want to come. 
um, when you when I talk to youth a lot and I do these roundtables in the ward, I'm over top of recreation, libraries, and youth affairs on my committee as a council member, and I'm in the schools. I was in the school Friday um, teaching a class at Johnson Middle School. I do stuff all the time in middle school. One of the curl issues is that I don't feel safe. I, I got to go through all these neighborhoods just to make it to school, and so if I got to go through this to get to school, I got to carry a weapon, and you're talking about kids as young as middle school, so you can imagine what's happening in high school. Um, we have to have some offerings. I mean, Historically in the district, when you was even on a college track or career track, and now we are graduating people from our high schools for those who do graduate with no uh, road to success. DC is becoming more and more expensive to live in. And so there are a lot of careers, there are a lot of uh, economic upper mobility avenues that we can take, but we're not have we don't we're not pushing our kids there or not train them while they're in our care for the four years they're in high school. There and and I don't want to say it's not happening at all, because that's an overstatement. There are CTE programs in certain places and spaces, but one, the kids not taking advantage of them, or two, they're not getting any certifications. For example, we got the uh auto mechanics program in Baloo. In the last three years, you know how many kids got certified? In three years, that's at least over 125 students in three years. One, we talk about the uh, police, uh, the police uh, training program at Anacostia High School. Three kids, last I checked, was three kids in four years. They're actually going to, so it, it's a disconnect somewhere, and we have to be more intentional about getting people ready for the next step after high school. And that will keep people there. If you come in, if you know the beginning, if you know the end at the beginning, it gives you motivation to wish your why they're coming back every day. And we've been very primitive with the 80-20 rule that we just changed. Um, because at first, when you miss a certain amount of days, you automatically fill the class. And that stuff, the, the system was messed up and it was reporting an error. So you tell a kid to come to class and the class, even if they did all their work, they still get an F because they missed a certain amount of days. And so there are a lot of factors that come into play, but we got to make it more attractive. We got to get some more people from the community working in the schools. They can see, feel, and touch that they know um, that's keeping them, helping them keep it safe and give them a sense of belonging while they're there. Yeah, thank and you, deal with, and teacher retention. I, I don't want to leave that out. We have some of the highest teacher retention issues in, 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 in DC and we, it's hard for us to keep teachers, man. Thank you, council member. We have another question from the audience that goes back to public safety. Uh, you mentioned that you're supportive of more resources um, uh, in the budget for public safety. Uh, looking ahead to the budget season, do you anticipate that your colleagues would be willing to shift funds out of their respective initiatives or respective preferred areas to, uh, to uh, join you in that call for more public safety funding? I can't speak for them. I can only speak for Trey on White, um, but I'm damn sure going to be working hard to ensure that, you know, uh, that not just the police department, absolutely the police department, there, but we have, the council members have oversight of other government agencies that's just impacted by crime too. You're talking about the uh, DBH, Department of Behavior Health. You're talking about DOH. I mean, you're talking about uh, DYRS. Um, you talk about, you know, every agency is impacted directly or indirectly by the crime in D.C. And we should be doing all we can to ensure that our budget items reflect that it's a serious issue for all of us. Tony, let me turn it back over to you. Well, Councilman, uh, let me just uh, share with everyone. Everyone should know that uh, Councilman White, uh, and this is something I deeply admire you for, Councilman, you know, visits most of the victims' families uh, when there, uh, you know, are incidents of crime uh, in his ward, and this is not just, you know, taxing from a scheduling point of view, but uh, you know, I can speak as you know, as a mayor, it's got to be just emotionally taxing, right, Councilman, to talk to these families, these mothers, grandmothers, grandfathers. Very much so. Um, I just had to go to a visual in Congress Park Friday night. Had another one Saturday morning outside in the rain. Um, and, and the sad reality is that not only just talk to the family, but I know the families. Um, the one I went to Friday night was a young man who was innocently shot, but his aunt lost her son two years ago at school. And so you talking about the, the grief on his family. Um, and then I can go down the line for other people in their family been directly impacted by violence. 
in the course of three years. And, and the kids that were outside when you're hitting 13 to 70 rounds going off. Um, and so that, that's a lot of trauma. That's a lot of mental health. And so while it's a struggle for me, you know, I, I'm, I'm there. I try to show support and love to the family, but, you know, they say hurt people hurt people. So we don't know what that long-term trauma is doing in the community. And it's showing up in different spaces and places in an unhealthy way, if not treated or, or mm -hmm. dealt with properly. And talk to me about on a, a, a lighter note, but uh, important as well, all the work through Congress Heights and the St. Elizabeth's campus and, you know, the uh, sports entertainment, monumental, everything going on. Talk about where that is and uh, the kind of vision there and how that's going. Well, it's, it's coming along. It's, it's an amazing sight to see. Uh, as you mentioned, we have the sports and entertainment center there. We actually just opened up a new parcel called Sycamore Oak, uh, which we have 13 um, minority businesses, Black-owned businesses there who normally wouldn't get a chance to open up a storefront because they don't have the resources or funding or capital to do it. Uh, uh, Open up business there from uh, Cheers to I mean to Dion's to the museum. There's so many clothing lines there. It's it's amazing. Um, we got some other parcels that has come through Dempad that's being bid on now. That's going to come on come online, and so we are working in conjunction with the mayor's office in Dempad to figure out how we can keep this property moving along. And so we have uh. Eight new buildings that's occupied by new residents there, so it's coming to life. We have some new townhouses that are occupied now. I think it's about six more being built. Um, so yeah, it's it's amazing. And the whole area you mentioned, Red Rick, the whole area around the, you know, uh, entryway into the city from Sutherland, South Capitol, coming through, you know, Poplar Point, Berry Farms. We're talk about where that stands right now. Um, it's in the transition phase. Uh, some there are some plans in progress. There are some thoughts on what we should do here and there. Um, and with as you know, we had a lot of changeover in government. You know, we had at least since I've been in office, we had three leaders of Dempad since I've been in office. Um, uh, so it's been hard to get some continuity and to keep on the same track. But nonetheless, uh, it's a plethora of opportunities, and we just. You know, we want to have responsible development coming that's community friendly. That's something that the people can embrace and can't afford. I just went to a convenience store this, this morning after meeting with some seniors at the Robert Walker house and they want fresh produce. They want somewhere to go. They want somebody to walk. They want to go somewhere where they can buy a shirt to put on. They don't want to have to get it on, go get metro access to go all the way somewhere on the Maryland side to get to buy a shirt, you know, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. to get some food. Yeah, mm -hmm. So, uh, we're working on that diligently every day. And uh, now you now that Ward, well, formerly Ward 6, and, you know, the uh, west side of the river is now in Ward 8. Talk about how that's changed your job and how that's changing your agenda. Or has yeah, it changed um, your agenda? Yeah, it, it's and what, definitely and what different. what parts are added to Ward 8? Talk to us about that. Great. So uh, if you come from Anacostia Station towards High Road and Cross or Cross towards South Capitol Street, everything that's on the right, except a small parcel, is considered now Ward 8 from South Capitol down to the bridge, all the way down M Street, all the way down to Capers. Um, I was there yesterday at the Van Ness Elementary School Festival. And so I make my presence felt. I introduce myself when I'm down there. It's different because a lot of the buildings are big, gigantic buildings, and, you know, you can't get into them. And so there are certain groups that have different events. So I go in here. Their concerns are different. Um, we just did a community walk with the ANCs there, what, five weeks ago? Um, and so we're hearing their concerns, figuring out ways to help them. Uh, my staff is stressed thin, I must say. I'm telling uh, uh, Chairman Mendelson, we need some more staff, man, because the, the issue we're facing in this war is becoming uh, a bit much to, to, to address all these issues. And so... It's different, but it's 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 good. It's good energy. You, I mean, without bragging, and uh, no other councilmen are on the phone. I mean, I mean, just from my experience, it seems that you're on the, and I say this as a compliment, you're on the Adrian Fenty uh, spectrum in terms of intense contact with your constituents. Yeah, uh, I guess you probably know more than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he was he was very one. Whatever people thought about Adrian. 
he was very much in touch with people when he was Ward Four Councilman. So yeah, you, you, you that's an intense experience, right? Yeah, it's a gift and a curse though because the the need is so big, and then I'm I'm probably the most active council member on social media, and so if I open, I have about seven thousand DMs of a question. Most I meet most people at their worst, and so people not just message me saying have a great day. They saying, man, my unit is flooded. It's been like this for three days. We can you get somebody over here right now? Or the dog bit my son. The neighbor's not moving. When I see them, it's gonna be a problem. It's 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 real life issues every day um, that so, uh, I get messages. So it's, it's it it's, it sounds sexy to be on the ground being active, but it it's a lot of work to tell you that. So you would you know would you support the proposition that say back in my day, the district budget was six billion dollars. We put in an environmental regime, a context where people came to the district, they invested in the district. Now the budget is, what is it, around 20 billion? We're able to yep. invest in all the services and new recreation centers, all the services you're talking about. Do you think that's a good program? Or create an environment for investment that leads to the kinds of investments, public investments, public goods that you're talking about? Does that make sense to you? Um, I'll have to learn more about it. It sounds like an interesting concept, but I believe that everybody she have a responsibility about putting something to the in the pot to grow the well, district. That's true. You know? That's true. Um, and but I guess my point is, you can't. You know, you got to have a pot in order to, you know, make the public but, investments in public goods, right? You need the economic development. Yep. Yep. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> when you look at now uh, your committees, talk about the committees that you're on and uh, some of the different issues and some of the overlaps with your award responsibilities from your committees? Well, primarily um, overseeing uh, DC libraries, um, DC Department of Parks and Recs. Um, so all the activities happening in and around recreation centers. Um, D DYS, Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services for youth who are detained um, in the district. We have a facility here in DC at YSC on my Oliver Road and also in Law, Maryland. Um, there are a number of other agencies that we see like the Office of Cable Television. It's a long name now, but the Office of Cable yeah. Television. Yeah. Um, so talk, uh, about, uh, youth and, talk about youth services. Is, where, is youth services and, uh, you know, the, at least the ideal and the objective is a rehabilitation of youth. Where does that stand by your uh, set of measures and your uh, evaluation standards? Yeah, so, um, well, I think that we, we have a new director that just started probably like four weeks ago. So we, we want another director again, man. But ultimately, we want to make sure that we are providing opportunity for youth to get, once they get into the district system, to turn their life around. Um, and I think that uh, D.C. has become... Uh, a city that's been doing remarkable as relates to programming in the institutions, but we're trying to be proactive before they get to us. And so one of the things that you hear parents say is my child can't get any help unless he or she get locked up. I've been trying to tell y'all he off the chain. Nobody want to listen. So as soon as he bust somebody up the head and rob him, then y'all want to come and lock him up. And so last year I, we officially started the Oasis program to engage uh, we don't call them at risk no more. We call them at potential. You who are not in the system that we know having problems in school, not showing up home, getting high every day. And so we started that with as young as middle school to engage them. Um, but we uh, we have to bro broaden our net because we're not catching them as many as we need to because we can see by the data of the youth that are getting in trouble, you know, escaping, escaping through what we miss them. So that that's come with the justice system working in partnership with the district to ensure that we can provide love and support, but also accountability. So we're, so what, talk about some of the different, uh, uh, I mean, people have been talking about providing structures and support for youth for, you know, for probably for time immemorial. Talk about some of the new things you're trying to do to provide real effective structure and potential for the kids. So outside of my, my, I want to say nine to five was not a nine to five. I uh I'm on the board of a foundation called Heroes DC, 
-hmm. that's designed to great organization. Uh, yeah, it's a nonprofit. It's designed to put career careers in front of our kids, and so we work with the schools to provide and within the business community. Um, and I talked to uh Mr. Mr. Linda Rusty Linda about this as well, mm -hmm. trying to get people in the in the industry. You and I spoke about this inside of our schools. They can mm -hmm. see, touch, and feel mm -hmm. people from mm -hmm. different walks of life and mm -hmm. different fields with diversity. Um, and I think that's critical because sometimes our youth become what they see. And I know for me, when I was young, growing up, I didn't say I didn't see a lot of men getting up going to work every day, ever. So that was a problem for my psyche. But I was, through the grace of God, I was able to get older and get exposed to a number of things through different programs, through the recreation centers, through sports. Um, and so that kind of gave me and, and my uncle. So, yeah, I think so. I'm working on that. That's been going on pretty consistently for two years. But we got to do more, not mm -hmm. just in Ward 8, but across the city. Yeah. So uh, what Ward 8 is, a, especially now with a new addition, but even before that, New, relatively new edition of old Ward 6. You know, you could almost say as a ward of real contrast, you've got uh, wealth, you've got deep investment, and you've got, you know, struggles and real challenges for a great number of people. And uh, our friend, uh, Mayor Barry, he understood the special role that he had re representing Ward 8 in the broader city, and even on a national basis. How do you address how do you approach how do you leverage if you, if you do i don't know your special role is a councilman of ward eight you're not just another councilman you're a councilman of a unique place in our city did you hear all that or did that make any sense say that again for me mayor williams you know you're in a unique war uh, deep investment. We talk about monumental. We talk about the uh, across the river in Ward Six. You know, a lot of good things happening in Ward Six, and at the same time, real struggles, real challenges. You can speak with authority, both because of where you are and the conversations you have every other day with real distress in the city. Like our friend Mayor Mayor Barry used to. How do you leverage and really use that unique position? as a special voice in the city? Well, I consider myself an expert on the topics I speak on um, mm -hmm. with great authority. Mm -hmm. um, and some people like to downplay that, but I, I, I know the work that I do every day. I know that I've been doing this work prior to becoming a council member, and I try to leverage that uh, with building greater relationships. I mean, and I'm trying, and that, that's what brings me here, here today. You know, mm -hmm. I think for me, it's about, you only can go as high as your leader. And John Max Maxwell talks about that a lid lifter. And so as I expand and grow and mature and bringing in other people that can help move the water along uh, responsibly, uh, it, it helps people to move along. And so I think that Mayor, Mayor Burry was the best who ever did it. Um, as far as using his platform and his, his intelligence and relationship to take the city to new heights. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I think you've done mm -hmm. a number of things economically as well. So I'm just hoping to glean from that and figure out a way to do it responsibly without displacing people. Yeah, yeah. So when you talk about, uh, uh, how do you, I'm just interested, uh, who do you look at, at as you, you mentioned, uh, the mayor, who do you look at as your kind of like gold standard for uh, your job as a councilman? Gold standard? I don't know if I look at anybody as a gold standard. I mean, I guess for me, I just kind of take a little bit from different people uh -huh. that I speak, learn along the way. I'm a, I read a lot. So, I mean, a lot, lot of not even political people, um, people that have just done things differently that's been sustainable and created some long-term effects in the community. Um, and so it's, it's a wide range of people. Mm -hmm. Like, give me a couple examples. Well, I, I look at... um. I look at Marcus Garvey, right? I see mm -hmm. how he, during a time of racial disparities and strife in the community, was able to raise over a million dollars on several different occasions. You know, he was able to partner trying to build a steamship to take people back to Africa. His movement didn't quite make it the way it needed to be, but it has to be nothing sort of remarkable for a, a black man to raise millions of dollars during that time. You know what a million yeah. dollars was back then, what it's paid to now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... You know, his ability to organize, get people 
involved. And that's what I try to do in Ward 8. I try to get people to see their potential, that you got to participate in your own destiny and no one is coming to save us but us. And so as that message resonates, we try to find out what are you, what's your gifts, what's your talents, what, what do you bring to the table and, and, and edify that to make people feel valuable. You know, when you do that, it changes the trajectory of, of, of neighborhoods, communities, and more importantly, families. You feel that that's, uh, yeah, that that's uh, taken hold? Yeah. Slowly but surely, absolutely. Yeah. So some final, I know that you have to make it to your next engagement. So some yeah, final thoughts. Yeah, everybody's waiting for me. I know. Yeah, like so some, but, but we waited so they can wait. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, but uh, but some final thoughts you want to share with the uh, folks here. Uh, and we really thank you for taking time out of what's clearly a busy schedule. Yeah, no, definitely. It, it's, a, it's a privilege and an honor um, as we communicate with District Strong, trying to figure out how we can collaborate. Uh, and as we talked about it, you and I have been talking. And I want to continue that conversation. Uh, here and, and with some of your colleagues to figure out what we can do collaboratively, right. collaboratively to move the district forward. So I'm committed to that, man. Well, thank you, Councilman. Uh, we really appreciate the conversation. Wish you the best. Good luck in your next engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. God bless. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we have. Another upcoming District Strong with a member of the DC Council, Council Member Brooke Pinto. This will be in person for federal city council members only, November 6th from 8.30 to 9.30. And again, we appreciate you for uh, spending your lunch hour with us today.